let's get started here. So let's start with what is medical documentation. So we use this term very loosely, but a lot of people don't know exactly what we mean. So I like to think of it as a story that begins when the patient enters the emergency department and carries on until their disposition is executed. So not just until we decide what it is, but until it's actually enacted. So a good way to describe it is a narrative. And this narrative will naturally include information that happens before you enter the emergency room, as that provides all the context of why they're here. Also, beyond just being a story of what's happening, this document can be very important. It's a legal document. So you wanna make sure everything you're documenting is accurate, true, fully explained, it allows other providers to understand what the emergency medicine team has done for the patient. So if the patient gets discharged to follow up with their primary care doctor, their primary care doctor being able to see this note is gonna allow them to have a starting point from which they're gonna manage the patient's care. Similarly, the specialists or hospitalists, if the patient comes into the hospital, the team that's taking over their care is going to really care about what we've done. And this kind of documentation makes it very easy for us to communicate the type of care we've provided. This is also a chance for the provider to explain why things were done. Medical decision-making doesn't always come across in the lab work or the physical exam. This is the chance to explain why you've ordered tests, why you've treated with medication, et cetera. Also, it's a good reference for any time the patient comes back into the emergency department to know what has been done in the past. So why do we document exactly? First and foremost, we document for the sake of our patients. Documentation holds the ED team accountable for giving quality care. The patient is also able to access these records for either their own use or the use of their providers at home. So ultimately, everything that we document is for the patient's good. We also do it to help other healthcare providers, like I mentioned. People who are going to be reading this have a very interest in what we've done to help the patient so that they can take the necessary steps to continue this care. We also document for ourselves. You might see a lot of patients over the course of a single shift in the emergency room, let alone two shifts, a week, a month. So by documenting exactly what was done, you're able to go back and reference this information in case you were to need it for some type of case review or a lawsuit, God forbid, you have the entire narrative of what happened to help refresh your memory. Looking at a chart that says patient came to the emergency room and was discharged home isn't gonna allow you to understand what was done for the patient, especially if you don't remember much about them. And finally, we document for billing purposes. You know, the hospital gets reimbursed, um, the hospital gets funding based on certain compliances, the, we bill patients based on the type of care that they receive. So if someone comes in for a finger laceration, they're going to be billed appropriately. On the flip side, if a patient's coming in for an acute MI, the, the payment and sliding scale for how much we bill is gonna differ. So our documentation allows the billers and coders to understand the quality of care that we've given and the level of care we've given so that they can be compensated appropriately. How do we document? This is a tough one. A lot of hospitals, and across the country and the world are going to be using electronic medical records software. This can be especially helpful because it is a nice, smooth, um, very well put together piece of software that can really guide individuals who are new to medical documentation. On the flip side, a lot of people don't have the privilege of using in EMR software and will have to use paper records, which can be just as good as long as you know how you're going to be putting this note together. Looking at a blank sheet of paper can be really intimidating because you know what you did, but it's sometimes difficult to understand how you should be presenting that information. So this is what I'm here to help you with. The overall format we're gonna to use today is called the SOAP format. It's highly applied across the board. Many people have used this for a long time. And also this format is kind of the basis for these softwares. So this is really a well-applied method that we're gonna talk about. So SOAP format, it's an acronym. So SOAP stands for Subjective, Objective, Assessment, and Plan. So we're gonna break down the four components of the SOAP node. 
into a couple subcomponents that are going to comprise our entire emergency room medical documentation. Subjective information is going to be that which is provided by the patient themselves, their family, their home health care aide, the facility they live at, transport personnel such as uh, emergency first responders, um, their own doctors who might call us ahead of time to give information. And this is not something that we can be verifying, which is what objective information would be. This is a secondhand account that's being given to us. Even if it's coming straight from the patient, we can't say what it feels like to have their abdominal pain. So this is gonna be what's provided to us by the patient. So in terms of our note, three subsections fit under subjective. We have history of present illness or HPI. We have the review of systems, and we also have the past history. So we're going to go into each one of these parts specifically and talk about what you want to include. So history of present illness is essentially going to be a summary of what brings the patient to the emergency room today. So the patient might have an extensive history that you want to talk about, but the first thing you want to mention within your HPI is going to be the actual chief complaint. And rather than just saying patient comes in for abdominal pain, period, and moving on to the next part of the note, we really want to get a sense of what kind of situation brings the patient in. So there are a couple of key points that you want to include in the history of present illness. The first is going to be the quality of the symptom. Is it, if it's pain, is it achy, stabbing, burning, uh, throbbing? You also want to talk about severity. Is it minimal pain, mild pain, severe pain? You can also use words that the patient says like crippling, excruciating. Um, we just really want to get a sense of how severe this pain is. Also rating pain out of a scale of 10 could also fall into this category. We also want to describe location, not just general location, but trying to be as specific as possible. So rather than just abdominal pain, maybe right upper quadrant abdominal pain, rather than chest pain, maybe substernal chest pain, left-sided chest pain. So different locations are going to make us think about different differential diagnoses. So this information is going to be incredibly important for our medical decision-making and should be located in the HPI right at the top, right where you know the provider who sees this note next or the patient is gonna be able to see it right away. Timing and also duration are very similar, so I want to make a quick distinction. So timing might be pain onsets in the morning or pain onset two days ago, one week ago, a month ago, whereas duration is going to be how long the patients had pain, either acutely or generally. So if you had an onset of chest pain yesterday, that'd be the timing. If this chest pain lasted for three hours, that would be the duration. So if a patient has three days of constant pain, the word constant would be important because that tells us that the pain was going for those three days. Whereas patient having intermittent pain for a month with episodes lasting for 20 minutes, that would be a different type of duration. So it's important to make that distinction. We also want to include any modifying factors when we're describing the symptom. So abdominal pain that worsens with food would be important because then you might start to think about some type of gallbladder pathology. If pain is relieved with having a bowel movement, that might lead you in a different direction. Similarly with chest pain, if it has different modifying factors, it feels better when you sit up, versus lie down, we would want to know this so we can get a better idea of what we might think the pathology is. Similarly to modifying factors, you want to include associated symptoms. Do they have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea with their abdominal pain? Do they have shortness of breath associated with a cough? This helps us paint a broader picture of not just that one singular symptom that the patient is going to come in with, but we want to draw out as much information as possible so that we can get a full picture. Sometimes the patient doesn't know what information is important, so asking questions about these types of things really helps you to get the information that you need. And the last thing is social context. Did the patient have an episode of syncope after they ran a marathon and didn't drink water all day, 
or was the patient sitting in a chair comfortably after just eating and drinking and suddenly syncopized? So understanding the social context with which the symptoms fall can really help you paint a better picture. A couple tips for when you're actually writing the HPI. You wanna be direct and concise. I mentioned earlier, you wanna make sure the first sentence of your HPI is the chief complaint. Even if the rest of the HPI story you're telling kind of meanders through something started last week and then today there were more symptoms, even if that's the case, the very first thing you wanna say is what is bringing them into the emergency room today. Um, this gets the point across very quickly for anyone reading the note of exactly why they're here. And then the rest of the HPI will give you a context to why that's important. You wanna tell a story. A lot of people have all of the necessary information to fill the HPI, but they don't know how to present it in a way that makes sense. So when you're giving information, you wanna make sure that it flows in a way that is chronological, in a way that is very sensical. You wanna make sure that Sentence to sentence, the reader isn't jumping from one place to the next to the next. You wanna make sure it's just very cohesive. Be aware of the type of picture you're painting as well. So the patient's own description of their symptoms is gonna dictate perhaps the direction of care, but your interpretation of that information is ultimately what's gonna dictate what type of imaging and testing that you order and what your possible disposition is going to be. So you wanna make sure, despite the fact that the HPI is in the patient's voice, it is the patient explaining their story, you don't want it to contradict the rest of what you're doing in the note. So if you're painting a story of very severe, debilitating pain and symptoms that are uncontrolled at home, and then your disposition is that you're gonna send the patient home or you're not gonna order a CAT scan or you're gonna do only basic labs, this might be very confusing based on the, paint, uh, the picture that you painted in the HPI, that this is something that's quite severe. So while you're always supposed to use the patient's voice, make sure that the way you're presenting it is gonna reflect the type and level of care that you're providing. If you leave yourself open to patient has pleuritic chest pain, they were just on a flight, they are on oral contraceptive medication, but then you don't order a D-dimer or um, some type of CTA, then the big question anyone's gonna ask looking at the note is, the, the HPI paints a picture of a pulmonary embolism. Why did we not order any of those tests? So you wanna make sure that everything is cohesive from what you're saying from the HPI all the way down to your disposition that it makes sense to anyone who would read it. Remember your audience. Acronyms are very useful, but not everyone reading the notes is going to understand what you mean. An acronym like IBS for irritable bowel syndrome might sound very obvious to you, but if the patient reads it, if a biller or coder reads it, if a lawyer reads it, they might not understand. Especially acronyms that can be vague. So patient has a history of PE, pulmonary embolism, pleural effusion, you know, it might be very clear to you, it might not be very clear to the person reading it. So keeping sentences full with words that are not abbreviated, um, sparing use of acronyms is going to be the most helpful for you and anyone who sees the note. So, <clears throat> sorry, the last thing is watch your pronoun. And what I be mean by this is, if the patient is giving you some information and the patient's home health aide is giving you some information and so is the patient's father, saying he said this, it might be very confusing to understand who you're talking about. So he said the pain was very sharp. Is he the patient? Is he the patient's father? Is he the home health aide? So I like to call everyone by their role. The patient, the patient's father, emergency personnel, first responders, police officers, etc. This way you'll never have any confusion with who's talking. It can sound repetitive, but at the expense of being very clear. No one reading the HPI will have any confusion if you always call the patient the patient. Whereas he, she, they, it can sometimes be unclear where the information is coming from. So I'm gonna show a quick example HPI. It's going to look a little bit intimidating, but we're gonna break it down, not just line by line, but I'm gonna circle a couple things that um, are really gonna be important here. So 
The patient is a 57-year-old male who presents to the emergency department for four days of intermittent chest pain, one day of associated shortness of breath. Patient describes the chest pain as sharp, localized to the center of the chest. Patient reports pain is exacerbated with deep inspiration and improved slightly with leaning forward. Patient states that he became symptomatic yesterday while walking to the bus stop on his way to work, and so on and so forth. So a couple things we wanna highlight here. First, the use of the patient a million times. Sounds redundant, but you knew exactly who I was talking about the whole time. So using the word sharp here um, allows me to convey the quality of pain, which was the first thing we talked about in the HPI elements. Seven out of 10 in intensity um, allows us to speak on the severity. Center of the chest is a very specific location for this pain, which paints us a different picture than left-sided, right-sided, etc. Another thing you might want to add if you had this information was um, pain originates in the center of the chest, but radiates down the arm, um, around the rib cage, to the back, etc. So anytime the pain is deviating from its origin or spreading somewhere else, you also want to make note of this. We have yesterday. Um, this is the onset, so this would be the timing, whereas one day versus four days would be the duration. Again, another term that I didn't circle here, but that contributes to the duration is intermittent chest pain. So this way we know it hasn't been four constant days. If the patient were to give you information such as episodes of pain last 30 to 60 seconds versus 30 to 60 minutes, you'd also want to include that information in this HPI. So a couple of the things here are exacerbated, improved by, like I said, you want to explain what makes the pain better versus worse because this can make a big difference in the type of imaging and testing that we want to offer. Associated with shortness of breath, that's the only associated symptom here. If there were more, we would mention those as well. And then the social context of this case is walking to the bus stop on his way to work. So we understand the context with which the pain originated and also the social context of patient was on a cross country flight one week ago. So we see that not only does the patient have a history of prior DVT, they're not taking anticoagulants, they were just on a flight and they travel frequently for work. So these are all you know, part of the social context that is making us shape the way we're gonna treat the patient. We have an idea of what kind of test we wanna order based on this information and the context with which the pain is initiated. So the review of systems is broken down by body system. You will not hit all of these, I believe there are 14. Um, it's gonna depend on the acuity of the patient. A patient that comes in with a dog bite might not require you to go through every single system because you're gonna give them a lower level of care whereas a patient who's coming in to rule out a stroke, you're gonna to wanna to do all 14 of these because all of these body systems are going to be exceptionally important when you're assessing the patient. So the review of systems is a place for you to discuss symptoms that are not related to the chief complaint. So the patient might have chest pain and shortness of breath, but they might also have abdominal pain you know, every few weeks due to Crohn's disease, or they might have a facial droop from a prior stroke that has nothing to do with their current chest pain. Um, so you wanna be able to mention these symptoms. And an example of this would be, I suck. We've gone through the different body systems, and you'll notice that there are negatives as well as positives. Pertinent negatives are just as important as positives because it's important to know what the patient is experiencing. It's also important to know what the patient is not experiencing. So there are actually more pertinent negatives in this review of systems than positives. We see that the patient has congestion due to seasonal allergies, they have occasional headaches. Those are gonna be positive symptoms. But what we really wanna know for someone with chest pain and shortness of breath is in the cardiovascular section and respiratory section. So they don't have a cough, they don't have palpitations, they don't have leg swelling, and their general constitution is important. They're not febrile, they're not fatigued. All of this information is going to be really important when we go into the physical exam. 
So just because you don't have positive information, you might think that you don't have a review of systems. But that's not true because you already know all of these pertinent symptoms that the patient doesn't have. So that's important information also, and you shouldn't forget to include it. Past history. So the first thing we think of when we think of the past history is past medical history of the patient. So the patient in the HPI had a history of DVT. So you're thinking, okay, history of DVT. But our patient's past history actually goes well beyond simply the medical history. You also want to include surgical history. Has the patient had a C-section? Has the patient had um, their appendix removed, their tonsils removed? Even in childhood, these are all things you want to include in the past surgical history. Also, the person's social history. Is the person a smoker? Does the person use drugs? Is there is the person homeless? Is there anything that might inform our level of care beyond simply why they're here today? If they're a homeless patient, they might have other needs that we want to address during their emergency room stay. So this would be important to know right off the bat. Family medical history is important as well, especially for things that have a lot of genetic components. So, you know, patient's father had a Huntington's disease diagnosis at 40. That would be really important for us to know. Mother died of an MI at 45. Another important thing for us to know. Patients with family risk factors might require a different approach to care than someone who has no family history. You also want to include any allergies in the past medical history and also what types of medication the patient is currently on. You wouldn't want to give medication that would be contraindicated based on the patient's current medication. And also, looking at the current medication can help you catch any mistakes in the patient's medical history. So the person might claim that they don't have any past medical history, and then you look at their medication and they're taking metformin, and you're thinking, okay, maybe I should ask this patient if they have diabetes. Um, a lot of people, when they're reporting their own past medical history, will overlook things, especially people who are bad historians, or people who don't understand the medical jargon that's being thrown at them in their doctor's appointment, they're just thinking they're fine. Looking at their medication tells us something different and we wanna make sure to ask about those things. And the last is prior records. If the patient has been to the emergency department before, you might wanna see what they were treated with. So if a patient comes in with a migraine and you look and see they were treated for a migraine five months ago and the particular medication that they were given in the emergency room seemed to really help them, you might want to repeat that. Whereas if the patient is here for worsening symptoms and they were evaluated last week, you want to see what was done. You might not want to repeat a CAT scan that was done three days ago. Uh, you might not want to repeat labs that were done yesterday. So this is going to inform what kind of care you want to give. A quick example of the history would be similar. You want to put pertinent positives as well as pertinent negatives. So a person with chest pain, you might want to indicate that they don't have coronary artery disease. Um, but you would want to indicate things like diabetes, hypertension, prior MI. Surgical history, there may be none, but you want to at least show that you've checked their prior surgical history by indicating that there is none. There we go. <laughs> so social history, smoking one pack per day. I actually made an omission here because I wanted to bring it up. There's a bit of a difference between a patient who's been smoking for a week and 40 years. Um, there might not be a huge clinical difference, but understanding the context might help. Perhaps they want a smoking cessation conversation and knowing how long they've been smoking might help dictate how you want to approach that. So that's still going to be important. Um, family history, like we said, patient died, a uh, patient's father died of an MI. This would be important since they're here for chest pain. Making sure to note if there are no known allergies is important. And the medication, you want to note the dose, the type, and how often they take it. Do they take it once a day, twice a day, as needed? How much do they take? Um, these are all questions that you want to have answered in the history. So that was the subjective portion of the note. So a lot of that information is information that the providers are receiving from outside sources, whether it be the patient, the nursing staff even, uh, registration. This is all kind of 
information that you have to synthesize into your note. But next comes the objective portion, and this is what the provider is going to dictate. So we have three subsets, physical exam, diagnostics, ED course and treatment. So ED course and treatment, a lot of people are surprised that it's under objective because you can put your medical decision making here, which would be subjective based on the provider. However, in the emergency department course and treatment, you're going to explain exactly what's happening. So the patient received this medication, the patient went for this imaging. These are all tangible events that have occurred and that's why it counts as the objective. So physical exam, similar to the review systems, it's by body system. So first you wanna start with general appearance. Um, how does the patient look? Um, clinicians are very good at assessing the patient's condition based on how they look. If they look very sick and very severe versus if they're looking pretty stable and healthy. This often doesn't translate well into the note because a lot of providers don't know how to put into words this feeling that they get when they see the patient and they say, oh, well, they look okay. So making sure to explain awake, alert, and no distress. You can say patient appears sick, patient appears well, patient is cachectic versus obese. This is your opportunity to explain how the patient presents to you clinically. Skin, warm, dry, cap refill, um, wounds, rashes, burns, anything like that would go under this category. HENT is going to encompass all of the head region, ears, nose, throat, etc. Um, you'll also want to throw in eyes at some point. I haven't included a specific section for eyes, but if a patient came in with a corneal abrasion or a suspected corneal abrasion, you might want to do a focused eye exam with pressures and visual acuities and slit lamp exams. So the physical exam is going to be tailored based on what the patient's coming in for. Test and respiratory would be important in most patients, I would say. You want to make sure they're breathing in no distress, hear their lungs, hear their heart, feel their chest, pulses, um, especially noting what types of pulses you've checked, saying pulses intact, doesn't exactly paint a full picture versus radial DPPT tells whoever's reading this exactly which pulses you checked. Abdomen could be its own section, you. Neurological, you want to explain exactly what kind of neurological exam you're doing. Something I see often, almost every day, is neurological exam normal, which is very great to know, but it's more important to know how you came to normal. So talking about if the patient is fully oriented, strengths, sensations, that seems to be the typical neuro exam. However, did you check their cranial nerves? Did you check deep tendon reflexes? Did you check cerebellar signs? Saying that the exam is normal is not taking the step to explain what kind of exam you did. We talked about in the review of systems how pertinent negatives are just as important as pertinent positives. That's especially true in the neuro exam. Even if the whole thing is normal, explaining which tests you did to assess for normal is important because if you just check strengths, you could say neuro exam is normal. And if you omitted to do cerebellar testing, but that person actually had an abnormal finger to nose, this neurological status normal would be a lie. This wouldn't be true. You didn't lie when you said it because you were only talking about a specific portion of the exam you did. But you want to make sure to be very clear and explicit about what you did and what the result of that was so that there are no misunderstandings. If a neurologist documents an abnormal neuro test, your neurological exam is normal, is going to be a big red flag. Psychiatric is also a part of the physical exam that gets ignored or neglected. Um, this doesn't have to be in psychiatric patients. This can be in any type of patient, especially dementia patients who might have some type of altered mental status in terms of their mood. Are they aggressive? Are they agitated? Does this patient express a normal affect? Um, even patients that are in the emergency room for concerns that are not at all related to their psychiatric condition. 
they might be very nervous, very anxious, they might be shaking. So this is something you'd want to include in the physical exam. This might explain, for example, why a patient's heart rate shot up in the middle of the emergency room visit. If they have lipo syndrome, maybe that's why. And the physical exam, psych psychiatric portion, would tell us that. Next is diagnostics. These are going to be included perhaps in a couple places, but I like to include them in the ED course and treatment as a part of the medical decision making. And I'll show you an example of that. So a couple of things that you might find in your diagnostics, pulse ox, EKG, chest x-ray. The pulse ox I think is underutilized, but really important because if you're giving the patient supplemental oxygen, you wanna give a reason for why you're doing that. Showing um, an abnormal or low pulse ox would be a, a huge indication of that. Um, EKGs, you wanna make sure that they're interpreted um, and chest x-rays, can help explain why you've given medication or why you're ordering additional imaging. So you don't want to forget to include that as well. A couple notes about the ED course and treatment before we see an example. Like the rest of the note, this should be a narrative. You should start it off with patient arrived in the emergency department. You want to explain the things that occurred in a sequential order and you want to add times when relevant. If the lab calls with a critical value, you want to take a look at the clock and say, okay, at 10.38 a.m., lab called with a critical value because this time will reflect how quickly you can enact a treatment. So if this is a very critical lab value that requires immediate medication, you can show in your chart, I got the call at this time and I immediately gave, gave medication. So you have, in a timely manner, begun treating the patient. So that was, that's why timing might be important. Time you call the specialist. If it takes the neurologist 25 minutes to get to the ED, at least you called them as soon as you read an abnormal MRI. So keeping those times keeps everyone accountable for delivering care in a timely manner. You also want to use this space to explain your medical decision making. Even if it seems obvious to you, it may not seem clear to whoever's reading the note. So if the patient has a fever and you don't mention that, but you saw it in the vitals and then you give an antipyretic, reading the note, someone might not understand why you gave it. Are, is the patient in pain? You know, what, what would be the cause? So you really wanna spell out why you're doing what you're doing. Um, imagine that someone with no medical knowledge or no significant medical knowledge is reading it and you wanna make sure that it makes sense to any single person who would look at it. So we're gonna go line by line through an ED course example. Like I said, you wanna start it off with kind of the patient arrives in the emergency department or the patient's stable during our evaluation. If the patient is in acute distress, which we'll talk about a little later on, this ED course is gonna look a little different, but this would be someone who's coming in stable and otherwise healthy and in no distress. We mentioned um, just a slide ago that the patient was um, on nasal cannula. So we see here, patient placed on two liters of nasal cannula, secondary to hypoxia. So no matter who's reading this note, they can determine why we gave the nasal cannula. And also you wanna see what happened after. So once you implement a treatment, you don't just wanna say treatment implemented anyway. You wanna say, did they improve? Did they not improve? You know, are they the same? Do they require more treatment? So we said patient placed on two liters of nasal cannula because they're hypoxic and their oxygen saturation improved. So this would be a kind of full, complete explanation of why you gave it, what happened when you gave it, et cetera, and how much you gave. If you review prior records, you wanna say that you've done this and you wanna indicate a little bit of what you read. So you don't wanna regurgitate the prior records, but saying that they were here for chest pain a year ago might be important in the context of their back for chest pain. And this is something that they've been evaluated for in the past. Orders written, um, it's a really simple way of just saying, we've ordered testing in lab, which we're gonna talk about later. Patient treated with, Aspirin. So not only did we say aspirin, we said the dose 
and we said the root and we said y. So you want to make sure that everything in your note is making sense with the rest of the information in your note. So if you are giving 324 milligrams of aspirin, you want to make sure that in your meds ordered, it's not 81 milligrams of aspirin. This type of internal discrepancy would make people a little bit nervous about whether what's being documented is accurate. Once you have one mistake, no matter how small, you're opening yourself up for people to say, why, why should we believe anything that's in the note? So you wanna make sure to double check these things. Um, sometimes less information in this case would be helpful in terms of if you're going to put the wrong dose, perhaps aspirin oral for chest pain would be better until you double check the dose that you are actually giving. Sometimes leaving a placeholder for yourself to say, let me double check this dose before I put it in the note would be helpful. Also explaining he gave normal saline simply for hydration. Now that we've gone through the diagnostics and reviewed them, this is going to lead us down a different path. So we're explaining that the troponin is negative, which is really important for their chest pain, but we see an elevated D-dimer. So because the D-dimer is elevated, this is gonna lead us to want to obtain a CTA. Explaining this um, is gonna be incredibly important. So not just um, CTA ordered, but why? You know, this is your medical decision-making. You saw a lab value and then you decided to order a test. Further discussed with the patient, I'm very sure that all providers are updating their patients and reassessing their patients. However, this is especially something that doesn't make its way into the note. So you wanna make sure that you're getting credit for the care that you're giving. If you're talking to the patient about their lab values, mention it in the note so that whoever's reading the note knows that you've communicated these results to them and it's not gonna be a surprise. If the hospitalist comes to talk to them, they're gonna have an idea of what the patient's expectations are. If they walked in the room and the patient had no clue what was happening, never heard a single lab value, you know, they would probably want to start with your labs were abnormal rather than a patient who's fully updated, very aware of the plan, meaning the hospitalist, there's a little bit less of a background of discussion that has to be had. Also, making sure the patient consents to the type of treatment and testing that they're undergoing, explaining to the patient the risks and benefits. Um, you want to include that risks and benefits discussed with the patient. Patient agrees with getting further imaging or patient declines further imaging at this time. Again, chest x-ray we reviewed. Making sure to reassess patients. Like I said, all providers are definitely reassessing their patients. So don't forget to put it in the note as this information is really important. Is the patient getting better? Maybe that would be an explanation for why you're not giving more meds versus if the patient's getting worse, this explains why you're doing more. So if the patient said they have no improvement of pain and you give a second dose of pain medicine, now we understand why you've given more medicine because they're not getting better. Also following up on things you've done in the past, the patient was put on nasal cannula. So in our reassessment, we're gonna explain, are they better, are they worse, are they still doing well? Um, keeping that consistency, just because we already talked about putting them on nasal cannula, don't forget that we did that. You want to keep mentioning how they're doing. This is an example of appropriately time stamping. Call received from radiology at this time. This is important because since it's such a critical value, we want to document exactly when we received it, and then we see the decision was made to treat the patient a specific way due to this diagnosis. Also, we can see that you called the hospitalist, um, looks like about 20 minutes after you got the call from radiology. If the hospitalist doesn't call you back for two hours, at least you can say, well, I called them you know, in less than a half an hour from when we got the lab results, maybe they were just really busy. So keeping yourself accountable for timely care, but also to protect you when perhaps other things get in the way of this timely care. And seeing that, you know, the patient was admitted 
X number of minutes after I spoke with the hospitalist is important. And again, making sure that the patient is aware of what's happening and agreeable. This is something I'm sure every single clinician does. You wanna make sure that you say that you did it. Um, a lot of people say it's not about what you do, it's about what you document. This isn't necessarily true because the patient's care is first and foremost. So if you've done something to serve the patient, you know, you've done your job. However, if you don't document it, it's almost as if it never happened. And anyone reading the note isn't gonna be aware of it. So you wanna really make sure that if you've done things, say you've done them, take the credit for it, um, and make sure you, you spell it out. Assessment, this is essentially a diagnosis or a tentative diagnosis in the emergency room. A lot of the times, you're making sure the patient doesn't have immediate pathology that you need to have an immediate intervention for. Um, sometimes you won't know exactly what is wrong with the patient, but you will know what's not wrong with them. So having a tentative diagnosis is gonna be the end goal. And the assessment should make perfect sense based on the rest of the note. Someone should read through the whole note and when they get to the assessment, they should say, oh, of course. If your assessment is completely out of left field and it has nothing to do with the rest of the note, that's a red flag that something is missing in the medical decision-making explanation or there's just something that's not right. Um, so you wanna make sure if you've read the whole note and the assessment doesn't make any sense to you, how are you gonna change the note to paint the kind of picture that you ultimately made in your head of what this diagnosis is? The plan is the last part of the SOAP note, and this is gonna be your disposition, whether it's to admit or um, send home with follow-up. You're going to explain what the next steps are outside of the emergency room, and any other additional information that's important, such as plans for follow-up, prescriptions for medications, et cetera. So this is um, an example of a diagnosis and plan for a patient that's being admitted. So the diagnosis is acute pulmonary embolism, and the patient's gonna be admitted, not just will be admitted period, but we're gonna say where they're being admitted and under who. So if you needed this information, if you needed to contact whoever was caring for this patient, you wouldn't just say, oh, they're admitted, but I wonder where they went. Now you know that they're admitted to the hospital under a certain hospitalist. So this would be very different than if the patient was admitted to surgery under the surgical provider or trauma under the trauma provider. On the flip side, this is an example of a discharge disposition. So perhaps you did all the lab work and you saw that the patient has um, acute pneumonia but they're stable, they're oxygenating well, perhaps they're young, and you wanna send them home for follow-up. So you wanna explain the patient is being discharged, what the plan is. They're not just gonna go home into the void of no health care. You know, they're gonna follow up with a doctor in a timely manner. Um, we're gonna give them a prescription for their pneumonia. What kind of medication we're giving, what kind of course, that can be important. Um, you want to explain that the patient got their imaging and their laboratory results, especially if they're going to follow up with their doctor, who might not, one, have access to electronic medical records, or two, would have no way to have access to paper records. So making sure to provide the patient with the necessary information to bring to their follow-up appointment is important. Also, return precautions. The emergency department you know, is open 24 seven. We're here for patients who need any type of assistance. A patient might be stable when you send them home and you're probably pretty confident they'll stay stable if you're sending them home, but there's always a chance they're going to worsen, they're going to feel worse, they're gonna become unstable. So it's always a good idea. As I know, you're going to advise the patient to come back. It's a good idea to put that in your notes saying patient advice to return for newer worsening symptoms especially if they're getting discharge papers, including that will help them feel more comfortable about being sent home from the hospital. You're not abandoning them to go home and take care of their condition outpatient. They have the option to come back if anything changes, if they become nervous. Now quickly, I wanna run through a couple special cases. Um, I've given a good overview of what a typical semi-stable patient would be like in the emergency 
emergency room, but anyone who's been in the emergency room knows not every patient is going to be this stable. There are a lot of cases that require different management. So for critical care patients, you can use words like immediately, emergently, um, to describe the type of care you gave. If you were called to run to a room across the emergency department, you can explain the haste with which you took to see the patient. Um, you also want to discuss any critical intervention or result that you've gotten. If the patient had a head CT and they have an acute head bleed, you want to explain that they were sent for an emergent CT scan. The results were immediately read by radiology. You called neurology who was at bedside promptly. These are all adjectives that you can use to explain how urgent the care that you gave was. But make sure that your patient actually fits critical criteria if you're using this verbiage. So if the patient has a facial droop and you were rushed to the room, you got there emergently to give an assessment and you find out that it's a residual facial droop from a stroke five years ago, suddenly the patient's not as critical as you might've thought. So while you were called there immediately, you wanna make sure that they are actually critical. If you call the patient critical for the whole note and then you send them home with no follow-up, it's gonna be a huge red flag for if this patient is so sick, why are you sending them home? So you wanna make sure that the idea of being critical is a logical idea and not just, oh, I ran there, so they need to be critical. You wanna make sure that you truly thought they were critical enough to give them treatment adequate for a critical individual. A couple specific situations where there's critical care. Sepsis, documentation is important because a sepsis protocol is well documented. I mean, it requires a lot of benchmarks to be met. So patients who meet two out of the four vital signs um, elevations or depressions in temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, and white blood cell count. If they are meeting any of these criteria, you want to note that they're meeting them. So if the patient comes in with a fever and they come in tachycardic, you want to immediately say that because now we know why they triggered sepsis protocol. Not just that they did, but this is why. Also, with sepsis, the common mnemonic is, um, or the little trick is give three, take three. So you want to document when you're doing these things because it is super important for sepsis. So everyone will order antibiotics, fluid, and oxygen, but you want to explicitly explain that you've done this so that anyone reading the note knows that you've been compliant with this protocol. You also want to explain, we took a lactate. This was the result. Is it one? Is it four? That's going to change your management. Um, blood cultures, you're not going to be able to talk about the results, but you want to at least say blood culture sent and pending. X will follow up on them so they don't get lost in the void of medical testing. Um, urine as well. Sometimes it takes patients a really long time to give a urine sample. Sometimes you need to take it with a little bit more force. So you want to make sure that doesn't get lost. If it takes them a little while to give a urine sample, you might not put it in the beginning and then finish the whole note off and have not even thought about the urine. So you want to make sure to be accountable for these six things, make sure they're happening, make sure they're received. For a STEMI, important times that you're going to want to timestamp if possible are things like when you review the EKG, when consultants have called you back, when consultants are at bedside, which is going to be really important, and if the patient was sent for some type of intervention, like a cardiac catheterization, when did they go? All of these times are going to be important because STEMIs require very quick intervention. So showing what times these things happen can really prove how prompt intervention was put into place. Same thing for strokes. All these times are going to be really important, especially when you give certain medications such as TPA, when critical imaging is reviewed. You want to make sure to timestamp all of these times when appropriate. Same with a code. So if a patient has come in with active CPR versus a patient who loses pulses in the emergency room, you would document this a little differently, but you want to make sure that you are timestamping when appropriate things such as when you start CPR, when you give medications. During a code, documenting is honestly the last thing anyone's gonna be thinking about. 
And it's probably for a good reason. The patient comes first, the documenting comes second. But if you're able to recall or have someone write down on a glove or on a piece of paper or a paper towel, when this is happening, you're gonna be able to paint a really great picture of the type of care you're giving. So a little example here I have would be when you initiate the CPR, when you give medicine, when you check the pulse. Um, pulse checks, I think, are under-documented for timestamp because this actually dictates a lot of what you're gonna do. Are you gonna continue CPR? Are you gonna give more medication? So I think that pulse checks are a little bit neglected in the documentation. So make sure to add them. ROSC, if they got pulses back, indicate when. If they lose pulses again, or if they lose pulses period at all, you wanna say when that was, when you initiated CPR. Time of death, of course, is going to be documented. Make sure it still makes it to your note. Um, you would be surprised, this could be missed. And the kind of final thing to wrap up here is procedures are documented a little bit differently than the rest of the note. So you want to explain in the note, you know, central line was placed by Dr. X. But you also want to, since they're separately billed, include who's doing the procedure, the timing of the procedure. If you're intubating, did you use succinylcholine? Did you use ketamine? Did you use propofol? If you're suturing, what type of sutures? Were they horizontal mattress? Were they simple interrupted? What kind of tube? Also, the relevant measurements, such as eight sutures were used. The ET tube is 30 centimeters at the teeth. You know, it, uh, we used, you know, sterile procedure and we checked for equal breath sounds, all of those things, especially the patient's condition. You're doing a procedure for a reason. So you want to explain how did it affect the patient? So did the patient tolerate it well? Did it have to be terminated because the patient was doing poorly? Um, has their condition improved? Are their breath sounds better? Is the patient more stable? Are they in less pain? These are all things you want to include in documenting the procedure. You know why you're doing it. You want to make sure everyone knows why you're doing it by documenting exactly what happened. Every provider is going to do things a little bit differently in terms of you know, their own preference, the patient. So don't assume people will know what kind of tube you're using or know what kind of sutures you're putting in. You wanna make sure to be explicit in explaining it. So that's my last point here. So hopefully you can take all these tips and start enacting them in your own, either student notes or provider notes um, or some practice notes. I was told to watch medical shows and practice writing notes on fake patients. So you can do that too. <laughs> Grey's Anatomy is a bad one because they don't have real patients, but any of the other ones are probably okay.